Hey guys, good morning and welcome to Mercy Online. I'm your host, Jessica Murray, communications coordinator right here at Mercy Church. So glad to be with you guys this morning. Today I am joined by... Jack Guthrie, <laughs> multimedia director here at Mercy Church. So glad to be with you guys this morning. Yes. And I bet they already noticed. I know. Do you guys see these amazing see shirts we have on? Finally. These are the survey t-shirts. We're so excited. Do you want to tell them? Yeah, he's going to put confetti we'll in later confetti yeah, he's so, gonna put confetti in later <laughs> so yes we got the shirts as you could have probably guessed they say i love worshiping with my church jessica designed these did an <laughs> excellent job great colors i will say they're kind of memphis grizzlies colors so Ooh, unintentional uh, i don't know who those people are <laughs> anyway <laughs> if you filled out your survey you should have already gotten an email saying hey yeah you filled out your survey and you requested a t-shirt here's how to get it the reason we're not just shipping these things out all over the country, actually, for yeah. people yeah. is because we really want to steward uh, Mercy's resource as well, mm-hmm. really what how you tithe. Yeah. Um, so we've actually found out through the survey that a lot of you come in person quite often. Yeah. So check out the uh, link that you got in your inbox, fill out that form, and you'll be able to say, I want to get mine at Northeast. I want to get mine on Providence Road. Or you're also welcome at any time, uh, if it's convenient for you, to just stop by our office Monday through Thursday when we have office hours. Yeah, nine to four. Yeah, you can, yeah. You can come to our office, which is also Mandy Foster, our operations director's office, and mm-hmm. uh, say, hey, Jessica, hey, Jack. Hey, Mandy. Where's my shirt? Yeah, where's my shirt? Absolutely. Now, if, you, if you're new with us today and you are like, who are these people? What are they talking about? <laughs> what is this free? What is this shirt? What is going on? First of all, we just wanted to say welcome. Mm-hmm. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. We know that uh, there's a lot of reasons you could be worshiping online this yep. morning. Maybe like me, allergies are just taking you down. If I sound different this morning, it is because my allergies have wrecked havoc on me the past week. Yeah, beautiful on the outside, Jessica's lungs. It was it was Terrible. raining, um, not pollen, but it was raining like the beautiful flowers from a tree yesterday. And I thought, this looks incredible. And I was like, and it's raining death because of the way it, the allergies are affecting me. So if you out there are an allergy sympathizer and you feel it, you know what? Drop that in the chat. Just send a heart message and let me know that you know how I'm feeling right now. Um, anyways, I'm going to get off that tangent. But you know what is happening when we see the daffodils, the tulip, the dogwood, the red bud. You know what that means? <laughs> what, Jack? What does Easter that mean? Easter <laughs> is coming. <laughs> that does mean Easter is coming because spring means new life. Yeah. We get to celebrate the resurrection. Yes. Oh, it's going to be exciting. We actually have all of our Easter times for you. If you go to mercycharlotte.com slash Easter, bet you couldn't have guessed that, you'll find details for Good Friday, mm-hmm. Easter egg hunt, yep. and Easter Sunday. Yeah, and you should be at all of these things. Uh, <laughs> the Good Friday service is an incredible time as believers to sit mm-hmm. in this happened. Yeah. The world killed our Savior. Yeah. And we mourn that and we celebrate what we get out of that, which is a rejuvenated life. Easter egg hunt. Yeah. What an amazing time to invite family and friends and neighbors, anyone with a kid, to come <laughs> and collect Easter eggs and hear the gospel. Yeah. It's, absolutely. it's so easy. It's outside. You just bring them, say, hey, yep. come with me. Get your, get your yeah, kids yeah. have fun out in the yard. You get a little bit of a break. That's um, right. Then Easter. As you've heard Pastor Spence say, we really believe and we're praying and we're fasting yeah. through Lent for 200 people who don't know the Lord to come to Mercy. And in order to do that, we did change some service times, which you can find at mercychallet.com slash Easter. Uh, we also yeah. have, if you come in person, Easter Inviter cards. We do. Easter squares are back. We love the Easter squares. They are back. QR code. <laughs> also, you can text Easter. You can. To 704-387-6388. You can get a digital card. You can text it out to people. Yes. There's really no excuse to not invite someone to Easter. (laughs) Speaking of that, since there is no excuse, who are you going to invite to Easter? I think I'm going to invite some of the guys that play my Dungeons and Dragons group. All right. So if you're out there and you also like to play Dungeons and Dragons, you now know Jack is your your mercy representative for Dungeons and Dragons. I think I'm probably going to invite my hairdresser. Great. Yeah. She's joined us before, but also if you're watching, Kat would love for you to totally come this easter that's that's your invite right there can't wait to see you i'm actually going to get my hair cut soon so actually, i be... think bailey's setting an appointment with cat to get my hair cut as well because it's getting shaggy there you go we all have the same hairdresser here at mercy <laughs> she's great. all right well i know we're getting ahead of ourselves we're, we're just so excited about easter and the fact that it's coming and especially for jack and i who like a lot of our jobs is telling you guys about the exciting things that are coming we get excited like a month in advance for everything that's happening so anyways let's get back to this sunday We're glad that you're here. We're actually going into our Exodus series. I know last Sunday was a little different. We had Compassion Sunday. 
you can see my Exodus scripture journal is starting to fall apart because I've been bringing it with me every week to church. So if you don't yet have your Exodus scripture journal, you can go to our homepage, mercycharlotte.com, download your free version there. You can follow along with scripture. What we're going to do for service is we're going to have a time of worship. After that, Pastor Spence is going to lead us in a message through Exodus. Then we're going to go back into another time of worship. And then Jack and I will actually come back and just reiterate a few things that are happening in the life of mercy. And we'll kind of close down the Sunday service for you. Yeah, sounds great. So if you guys are ready, I would say put your coffee down. Put your hands hands up. up. Let's praise the Lord.
slaves from bondage it would take a god i do not know your god y'all good morning good morning mercy church man good morning hey good morning to our northeast family before we dive into our passage of scripture i gotta celebrate with y'all last weekend was compassion sunday here at mercy church and i told our um our god that works with compassion you know four years ago we had compassion sunday and they sent um, a bunch of opportunities for us a bunch of children that we could sponsor and we spent four years ago sponsored every single one and so I said, all right, man, you got to make sure you send enough that we all have the opportunity here because this church loves to be generous and believes in what you're doing. And he said, don't worry, man, we got you covered over and above. They sent over, uh, they sent right at 200 children for us to sponsor. So it's like, we got plenty um, for Sunday. So we thought, um, y'all last weekend, you sponsored 230 children for Compassion International. Um, y'all that... It's every single one that we had the chance to sponsor, plus like 30 more that we had to sponsor online. I'm so, um, I'm so thankful. Man, I'm so thankful to pastor this church, um, which also gets me excited about like our, our next step that we're taking together, and that's Easter. Easter is coming up fast. Stores are running out of peeps, you know, I mean, things are happening quick. Uh, so we are introducing to you this morning the greatest tool known to mankind to invite people to Easter, the Easter Square. Um, it's a simple little thing uh, that we have been using for a few years now, a little thing called the Easter Square. Don't sleep on these. Super easy to hand out. Let me explain Easter weekend to you guys. Good Friday, we will have a Good Friday worship night at both of our campuses, Northeast and at Providence Road. This is a great time. We're going to be um, celebrating communion together, praying together, um, singing a lot together. I'll have a shorter sermon on the death of Christ and reflecting on that for us. It's going to be a really really good um, time for us to worship. Our worship team is putting in a lot of work on that. And then Saturday morning is the annual Easter egg hunt. Okay. Now, yeah, the Easter egg hunt is for kids up through elementary middle schoolers. I'm sorry. Um, adults, I'm sorry. Okay. Like, no, but you can come and help middle schoolers. You talk to Brett, our student director, but um, you can come and help. In fact, if you email kids at mercycharlotte.com, we want to put a bunch of candy and eggs and that's going to take a whole lot. The reason we do it, the reason we do it is to try and make it really easy for you to invite your non-Christian friends and neighbors, just get around some other Christians. All right. And it's a chance for you to continue that relationship, hopefully leading them to faith, which leads me of course, to Easter Sunday. We're going to be adding a worship service at both of our campuses on Easter Sunday. All right. So you got a chance over there at Northeast. You get to add an 11 o'clock service and you listen to Joseph, your campus director. Don't all of you just go to that and sleep in. Okay. Got directions for you on that. And then here at Providence Road, um, get ready for it. We already have a nine and 11. We are adding a 730 AM worship service. That's right. Yeah. We're, uh, we're going to, we're going to get here so early. We might see Jesus come out of the grave, get there with him, man. It's going to be early. Um, but here's the point, y'all. I mean, this is just where the Lord has us as a church right now, and I'm super excited about it. We're going to need, if we really are going to pray for and invite 200 people that don't know Jesus to come to our gathering, we need to make room for it. For every single one of us, this is a missional move. Easter weekend's a missional move. In some way, you're taking your next step. Maybe 
Your next step is inviting. You, you, we can all invite and pray. And some people are going to take up that invitation and some aren't. All right. That's up to the Lord. That's between them and the Lord. You can pray and invite. Right. That's what we can do. Now, some of y'all need to take that step to come to the 730 service to be missional, literally with your seat making room for someone else to come and hear the gospel. Maybe you need to come to 7.30 and then serve at our 9 o'clock. We're going to need a lot more hands on deck that weekend. Some of you need to step up and serve. In fact, here at Providence Road, we were worshiping this morning, and I was worried that Lauren was going to have a baby on stage, middle of one of those songs. Some of y'all need to step on to the worship team and help out for a Sunday because we've got a lot that's going on, all right? You figure out what your next step is. Community group leaders, let me encourage you. Just be asking that together. What's my next step when it comes to Easter? And y'all have that conversation, all right? With that said, Exodus chapter 5, we got some ground to cover this morning. We're going to pick up where we left off. Moses, our guy, is finally going to go and talk to Pharaoh. And we've been building up to this for a while now, haven't we? God put Moses on a mission. There was some back and forth about the whole thing. And finally, Moses decides he's going to trust God and then he's going to obey God. Here's what we're going to see today. Moses trusts God, and so he obeys God, and then things get worse. They get worse. Has, can anybody relate to that narrative right there? Have you ever said, yes, okay, God, I'm going to trust you, and trusting means I'm going to take a step and obey you, and then life gets worse? There's this, um, all right, so I grew up in a Baptist church, a little Southern Baptist church, and I brought with me a relic of those days. This is called a Baptist hymnal, okay? Now, a, only a certain select group of people will understand what this is. This is a book with paper, and in that, there are all the songs that we used to sing, all right? That's what this thing is. And one of those songs that was a staple for, for our guy and our um, worship director, the associate minister of music, um, what, one of his staples was a song called Trust and Obey, all right? We would open your hymnal to 447 and sing with me, Trust and Obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. And if he was really feeling it, he'd be like, Jesus, do a little run. <laughs> then to trust and obey. And you know what? He was right. That song is theologically accurate. There is no other way to be happy in Christ, to be content and understand who you are in Christ and to walk forward with him than to trust and obey. But y'all, I feel like there was something missing in that chorus that got implanted deep into my brain. It's that when we trust and obey, we need to expect a battle. We need to expect that there's going to be a battle. And that's what Moses is not ready for. That's what we're going to see today. Even though the Lord told him there's going to be resistance, Moses isn't ready. And because he isn't expecting some kind of a battle, when he trusts and obeys the Lord, he wavers. And the people around him start to waver. Now, thankfully, as God is prone to do with his servants, is what we'll see today, he's gracious and patient and helps Moses. But there is a massive lesson for us in these three scenes that we're going to see unfold today. We're going to see Moses talk to Pharaoh. And then we're going to see the Israelites talk to Moses. And then we're going to go and see Moses talk to God. Actually, he's going to finish coming back around talking to the Israelites. But in those three scenes, there's one big idea that's going to come out for us. And that's trust and obey the Lord. And prepare for battle. Trust and obey the Lord and prepare for battle. When you get off the sidelines and you start taking next steps and following Jesus, expect the enemy to come at you harder than he ever has. Expect your sin nature inside of you to resist any pursuit of holiness you want to go on. Trust him, yes. Obey him, yes. But prepare for battle. We're going to get into our passage and we'll see what unfolds for our guy Moses. And I'll kind of just show you just some battle prep that you need to go through, all right, as you step out and as we as a church step out and obey the Lord together. All right, Exodus chapter 5, verse 1. Y'all ready? Yeah. Let's do this. All right, later, Moses and Aaron went in and said to Pharaoh, this is what the Lord, the God of Israel says, let my people, okay, let my people go. All right, he's going to say, let my people go. I want you to just pause there for a second. Let my people go so that this is a big moment. God's called him to it. Like I said, this has been a lot of struggle. Should I go? Should I not go? If I go, who do I say sent me? All that sort of thing. Uh, so that, look, in fact, I want you to, if you have your Bible open, I never do this in church. I want you to close your Bible right now. All right. Or turn off your Bible, whatever that is for just a second. Okay. For just a second. And if you, by the way, if something in you rises up, you're like, no, I'm gonna leave it on. 
If that's what it took to get you to keep your Bible open, so be it, okay? But for everybody else, everybody else, let's just close our Bibles for a second. Moses has some hesitations, but at the end of the day, he does. He goes in, right? This is the moment where his community group is like, way to go, man. You obeyed the Lord. Good job. You know, which is just Aaron, but still, way to go. Now, I want you to see something really important. This is why I asked you to close your Bibles. When God saves them from Pharaoh, he saves them for a purpose. You see, we're so pro, and especially if you grew up in a church setting like I did, but even if you didn't, you maybe heard it from pop culture, general references. You got this famous line where Moses goes in, Moses, go tell him, let my people go. And then, you know, all the actors, let my people go. And that's the thing you remember, let my people go. But there's a purpose. He saves them for a purpose. And my question, the reason everything's turned off is I want to ask you, do you know how to finish that sentence? Let my people go so that so that they may worship me. You can open your Bibles back up now, okay? Breathe. So that they may hold a festival for me in the wilderness. That festival is a worship festival. I decided this week, that's what we're renaming Sunday mornings. So Sunday morning worship festival. No, we're not gonna do that. That would be an interesting audience though that we would get. Um, But God saves them from Pharaoh so that they can worship him. The whole idea is that they're rescued for a purpose. They're rescued to something. And that's big because sometimes the Christian message can just be, hey, you need saving from your sins. It's true. But the full message is, you need saving from your sins so that you can be reconciled to God. So that you can worship him and walk with him. Let me say it this way. Our God is not a transactional God. He's a relational God. He's not interested in just wiping your record clean, and then you going on about your business. He's interested in cleansing you from your sins so that you can know him, be reconciled to him, and walk with him. Some of you have been stunted in your faith because you've treated God like he works behind the counter at Chipotle. And you've walked up, you said, one salvation, please, no beans. You know, Jesus is buying down at the end, and that's it. Let me go on about my way. That's not the gospel. But you're some of you never gotten past there. Listen, God made you for so much more than just getting out of hell. It's an announcement. The gospel is an announcement that you're rescued so that you can be reconciled to God. That's your purpose. You're made for it. That's your true freedom. And that's the whole mission of our church. Listen, our mission is not get people out of hell. Now, look, I do. I want to make it really hard to go to hell from Charlotte, North Carolina. Okay, I do. I really do. But that's not our mission. Our mission is to make disciples of Jesus who need to be rescued from hell and then learn to love God, love one another, and love our world. We want to walk with him. That's why you got to get involved in the church. You also can learn what it's like not just to be rescued, but to walk in that freedom that God has given you. I got to keep rolling. Verse 2. Pharaoh responded, who is the Lord that I should obey him by letting Israel go? I don't know the Lord. And besides... I will not let Israel go. It's Pharaoh's way of saying, that's a nope. Okay, Moses, that's a nope. I mean, you're talking to Pharaoh. Talking to Pharaoh. He doesn't obey anybody, let alone somebody he doesn't know. Well, then Moses and Aaron answered, verse three, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Okay, I love this. Because God's in that day and even in this day, don't, they don't meet with people. But our God, our God meets with us. Because he's a relational God. It's all over scripture, y'all. He's a relational God, walks with us, talks with us through his spirit. He dwells in us. Christianity is so different this way and so good. He says, the God of the Hebrews has met with us. Please let us go on a three-day trip into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. Or else he may strike us with plague or sword. The king of Egypt said to them, Moses and Aaron, why are you causing the people to neglect their work? Get to your labor. Get back to work. Pharaoh also said, look, the people of the land are so numerous and you would stop them from their labor. By the way, there's a little bit of fear that Pharaoh's saying in there. If you remember where Pharaoh said earlier, I'm going to actually put them into all of this labor because they're so numerous. I'm worried they're going to rise up and overthrow me. He's not interested in or concerned by the God of Hebrews. He doesn't care what's at stake for them. In fact, since Moses and Aaron got to town, people have stopped working. So now it's a financial nuisance for him. So he says, get back to work. Not only does he not do what they asked in a, let me show you who's the real boss move. Watch what he does. 
He makes things worse for them. Verse 6. That day, Pharaoh commanded the overseers of the people, as well as their foremen, don't continue to supply the people with straw for making bricks as before. They must go and gather straw for themselves, but require the same quota of bricks from them as they were making before. Don't reduce it, for they are slackers. That's why they're crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Impose heavier work on the men. Then they will be occupied with it and will not pay attention to deceptive words. Pharaoh's threatened, y'all. And when the enemy of God is threatened, he will fight back. He's going to make things harder than before. And I'm telling you this because there's a version of Christianity that doesn't really have a label, but it's, I've found it to be in ministry between Raleigh, Durham, and in Charlotte, a very prominent version of it that's among especially educated people that just simply does not believe that there is a real enemy out to destroy you and your relationship with God. It's too mystical, too abstract, or even mythical sounding. And if you're honest, what you end up, you won't say it out loud in church or something like that, but you, you think to yourself, I'm just, I'm too educated, too rational for that kind of belief. And yet scripture says, 1 Peter 5, be sober-minded. This is what it means to be sober-minded. This is what it means to be rational, be alert. Your adversary, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion looking for anyone he can devour. Let me, let me make sure you understand who your enemy, Christian, really is. The devil is, according to scripture, an angel who rebelled against the Lord, who is cast out along with his legion of angels. He is not like God. He's not all-powerful and all-knowing, but he's the commander of evil. He commands an army of demons who do his bidding and can deceive and torment people, even Christians. His sole aim is to sever your relationship with God here on earth and forever. He's real. He's powerful. He hates God, and he hates you. He doesn't want you walking with God. He doesn't want your family walking with God. He doesn't want your friends walking with God. He hates God. He hates you. He hates all of us. And he's not playing games with you. So don't play games with him. And y'all, he's not the only thing working against you. Satan, we could call the, the enemy outside us. And that's what we're preparing for today. But there's also an enemy inside of us. And that's the corrupted desires of our heart that the Bible calls our sinful nature. The Bible says, left to ourselves, we don't choose to follow God. We don't choose his side of the, ba of the battle. Left to ourselves, we choose darkness. Every person in different ways, but we, we are by nature sinners. And I say that because if you were to just say every bad choice you make is the devil's fault, you're going to never deal honestly with God. You say the devil made me do it. That's not confession. That's blame shifting. God offers forgiveness from sin, the enemy within, and victory over evil, the enemy without. So you ask, well, okay, but how do I know the difference? I'm going to be honest. A lot of times you're not going to. But if you prepare for battle, you'll be able to fight both. The rational mind is the one that acknowledges and anticipates Satan and his work. The fool ignores his presence to his own peril. And I bring it up. Because when you try to take a step in obedience to God, you're taking a step into battle with a very real enemy. And you need to anticipate resistance from him. That's the first thing about battle prep and spiritual battle is you got to anticipate the enemy. You got to anticipate the enemy. You never, I mean, you never would see like a general of an army or maybe a, a captain of a unit. Hey guys, we're going into battle. Now we don't know anything about the enemy. Some say, I mean, I didn't be out there, but let's just walk across this field and see what happens. You know, well, the, your soldiers at war, well, are there any landmines? I don't know. Let's just go out there and see what happens. Right? Well, is he waiting to ambush us? Eh, we'll see. Well, which route are we going to take? I don't know. I'm too busy on my phone to look around and see if there's an enemy. Could he be using your phone? Oh, I didn't think about that. No, no, whole nother sermon. All right. <laughs> look, whether it's resistance coming to church Resistance reading your Bible, distraction in prayer, resistance to the gospel when you share it. I mean, if we're all trying to invite 200 people that don't know the Lord to our Easter services, I guarantee you the enemy is going to put up resistance to that. Because we're following, what we're doing in that is we're following Jesus right through the gates of hell and trying to rescue 200 people. Satan doesn't want that, period. End of story. But the Western mind doesn't like to believe in that realm and in that reality because we can't explain it through the scientific method. 
When you step out and obey the Lord, you got to expect resistance. And then when you do, y'all, it's going to sound strange, but you'll actually be able to find a little bit of joy in the battle. I know that sounds twisted, but look, soldiers don't put on armor, and we're talking about armor towards the end of the sermon, and don't learn how to fight and carry weapons so that they can sit around idle. They do all of that in prep for battle. And when they finally encounter the enemy, they kick into gear because it's what they're trained for. Must be in the right spot. We've anticipated him and now we're ready. Let's keep going. I want to show you more on this. You jump down. Let's jump down to verse 19 where we see the second scene. All right. That's Moses with Moses with Pharaoh. Now the second scene is the Israelite foreman. The Israelite foreman saw that they were in trouble when they were told you cannot reduce your daily quota of bricks. So when they left Pharaoh, they confronted Moses and Aaron, who stood waiting to meet them. May the Lord take note of you and judge, they said to them, because you've made us reek to Pharaoh and his officials, putting a sword in their hand to kill us. They're frustrated. Understandably frustrated. Their first step towards freedom seemed like a step backwards. But when they met resistance, they identify the wrong enemy. This is your fault, Moses. They blame the messenger for their hardship, which is ironic considering just a few verses ago, towards the end of chapter four, they're worshiping the news that Moses delivers because God has heard their cries. They're celebrating we're going to be set free. But now that things are getting difficult, they're complaining to the very same leaders. They've identified the wrong enemy. Moses isn't their enemy. He's the one God has called to be their advocate. They're going to do the same thing a few chapters later when they're out in the wilderness and things get hard. They start complaining about Moses. Why'd you bring us here, Moses? It would have been better if we could have just stayed in Egypt, Moses. Yeah, Moses. When they heard good news from God, listen, they worshiped. When they encountered resistance from the enemy, they grumbled. One of the keys to understanding Exodus, I told you week one, is that we often find our best application when we put ourselves in Israel's shoes. And that's really true here. They went from trusting at good news, good time, maybe not good time, but good news about a day coming, to grumbling when life got harder. You ever do that? Ever complain when you're trying to just follow the Lord and things are getting harder? You're like, come on, man. You ever done that? I know I, know I do. And it is contagious. Look at what happens. This is what complaining does. It spreads frustration to everyone it touches. Watch verse 22. Moses went back to the Lord and asked the Lord, why have you caused trouble for this people? And why did you ever send me? Ever since I went into Pharaoh to speak in your name, he's caused trouble for this people. And you haven't rescued your people at all. He is all in his feelings right now. And he asked that question that everyone asked day three on a short-term mission trip. Why am I even here? Like day one, you're like, oh, look at God's bigger creation. I never knew something outside of this. Day two, you're like, I love the people that I'm meeting. They just, I wish they would use air conditioning. And day three, why am I here, God? Why did you send me? Because here's what we tend to think. (laughs) I thought it would get here. And then just because I stepped off the plane, revival would step into motion. I obeyed you. What do you mean I got to wait? What do you mean fruit doesn't grow in a microwave? We are so quick to doubt the Lord. So quick. There's a guy named William Carey, a missionary to India in 1800. And in so many ways, he inspired the modern missions movement. I mean, everyone from Adnar and Judson, Hudson Taylor, David Livingstone can trace back their inspiration to uh, his life motto, um, expect great things from God and attempt great things for God's combination of prayer and expectation and then action. But look, he went to India Because the church sends God's people to all people. And he worked for seven years before he baptized his first convert. Seven years. Here's my next thing for you in battle prep. You got to wait on the Lord and pray. You got to wait on the Lord and pray. Some of you have obeyed God and things have gotten worse lately. Your spouse is still cold to you. Even after you've tried forgiveness. In fact, now they're skeptical of your motives. Of course they are. The enemy underneath that is threatened. Your children are still running from the Lord. You've tried everything. Everything the Bible says you've tried. Your neighbor's still resistant to the gospel and you've tried everything. You're right there on the edge of doubting God. Is he real? Why did you even send me here? 
And all the while, we just need to wait on him. And what you need to be reminded of today is that he does, he does, he does hear the prayers of his people. Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. James 5, 16, the prayer of a righteous person has great power in its working. A pastor named Samuel Chadwick uh, lived about 100 years ago, uh, was, said this at the, uh, it was like 1920, said the one concern of the devil is to keep Christians from praying. He fears nothing from prayerless studies, prayerless work, and prayerless religion. He laughs at our toil, mocks at our wisdom, but trembles when we pray. Y'all, our prayers are powerful. They are effective. And sometimes we get it so reversed. We think our effort and our wits is what's really effective and prayer is just kind of secondary. But there's power in our prayer. You think about the book of Acts. Um, the, the early church prays for three days. Peter preaches for 10 minutes and 3,000 people get saved. And y'all feel like in our day, we kind of do the reverse. We preach for like three days and we pray, maybe tack on a 10 minute prayer sometime during the week and three people get saved. We got to revert. That's why, that's why we're doing this fasting and praying every Tuesday for eight weeks, the eight weeks of Lent. That's I was thinking about this, doing a little, some of you math nerds are going to love this. The rest of you hang in there. Okay. I was thinking about this over the eight weeks of Lent weeks. We said, let's sacrifice a meal every Tuesday. And we're going to take that hour and we're going to take that block and we're going to fast from food and we're going to pray. And part of what we're praying for is that the Lord would bring people that don't know Christ and they would bring them here and they would get saved and hear the gospel. If we do that, that's eight hours per person. That's about, it's about a thousand people that attend mercy on a given weekend. That'd be 8,000 hours of prayer. Let's just say we hit 25% of that. That's 2000 hours of prayer. And I'm gonna preach for about 30 minutes. I, <laughs> I think the Lord is in that kind of math because prayer is the expression of faith that unlocks the power of God. And then here's what I'm satisfied in. The answer to those prayers is the Lord's timing, not ours. So look, if we go in and we do all that prayer and not one person comes to know Jesus, I can look at the Lord and say, it's not because we didn't ask. It's not because we didn't ask. And one of the great battle tactics you can have as you follow the Lord and things get worse is patience in prayer. Spiritual patience is something the Bible says God's Holy Spirit gives you as you depend on him. Sin nature says complain to God and doubt him. That's not a battle strategy. God says wait and pray. Tell him what you need. Maybe what you need to do is remember that he loves you. He's here for you. In fact, that leads right to the most important part of this whole battle prep. I want to read you the opening of chapter six. The Lord replied to Moses. Now you will see what I will do to Pharaoh. This, by the way, we've moved into our third scene as we did when Moses was talking with, with the Lord. Now you'll see what I'll do to Pharaoh. Because of a strong hand, he will let them go. And because of a strong hand, he will drive them from his land. In fact, let's move down to verse six. Therefore, tell the Israelites, I am the Lord. Y'all, that's what we've been saying this whole time. Most important thing in your life is what you think about God. He keeps putting that back in front of them. I am the Lord. I am Yahweh. And I will bring you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians and rescue you from slavery to them. I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and great acts of judgment. I will take you as my people. I will be your God. You will know that I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out from the forced labor of the Egyptians. I will bring you to the land that I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a possession. I am the Lord. God's response to Moses, and you can tell by my emphasis there, is full of first person singular responses. God says, I am, remember back to the name, I am, and because I am, I will. It's a certainty. Verse 1 of chapter 6 says, now you're going to see. And everything, everything I just read you, that's the battle plan. It's not you. It's not Israel. God's going to do this. God's going to do it. All of it. Nowhere is Israel the actor. I am, I will, I will, I will, I will. My battle prep for you guys, as we think about us on this side of the cross, is to hold fast to the gospel. Hold fast to the gospel. The people of Israel heard it, but when the battle heated up, 
when resistance set in, they didn't want to hear about hope. Look at verse 9. Moses went and he told this to the Israelites, but they did not listen to him because of their broken spirit and hard labor. It's understandable and it's also a warning to us. It is so easy for suffering to close our ears to hope. You know it, I know it, in times of suffering, we're prone, so prone to think God is silent. But he is not silent. We just don't want to hear him right now. Don't tell me it's going to be okay. Don't tell me God's got a plan. Don't tell me he's working things for good. I trusted him and things got worse. Don't talk to me about God. Y'all, I think the Exodus, if you've ever felt that way, the Exodus is here to pry our hands off our ears because our heart needs to hear that God has not forgotten us when things get hard. In fact, according to chapter uh, 6, verse 1, he's working when things get hard. He is in that. He's working that. The worse is going to make his glory all the better. So don't close your ears to him. I don't say that lightly. As one who I've been through suffering in my life, it's an ongoing thing. And as it is for anyone who's going to follow Jesus, I do not say this lightly. Don't close your ears to him. In the Exodus, he reminds them of what he's going to do. He's going to redeem them, going to bring them out, going to be their God, going to fulfill his word, to give them that promised land. And they can trust him because he's the same God who protected and provided for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And when we prepare for battle, we have the hope of what God is going to do. Namely, going to bring us, his church, his people, into the true promised land, which is heaven itself. Eternity with the Lord in relationship with him, walking with him. But y'all, we also have the hope of what he has done. The gospel plants our feet in the past victory of Christ over sin and death in his resurrection and the future victory of the kingdom of God for all eternity. And in Christ, you're standing in and then walking towards victory. Victory, which is why Paul's gonna say in Romans 8, you're more than a conqueror through him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead. That unchanging truth, that is the armor against the attacks of the enemy. That he rose from the grave, that's armor. The apostle Paul believed in a real battle against a real enemy so much that he put battle armor language on how you walk forward in the gospel. This is Ephesians 6, verse 13. For this reason, take up the full armor of God. You only take up armor if you're going into battle. We got to wake up, church. Take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. And having prepared everything, take your stand. Then he explains, stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist. Belt holds everything together. What is the truth? I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. It's Christ and his gospel that you were loved with a love so deep and so powerful that nothing could ever separate you from it. Wrap yourself in that love. It'll hold everything else. Stand therefore with truth like a belt around your waist, righteousness like armor on your chest. The chest armor protects the vital organs, put on God's righteousness. The gospel changes your heart. You start to love what God loves and your feet sandaled with readiness for the gospel of peace. Readiness, being ready to go at a moment's notice wherever the Lord will call you in Christ. Man, this, um, I was thinking about this. Um, we had a buddy when we just had started Mercy Church, um, you know, back in, well, let me say back in the day, there were these things that certain types of people in professions had to wear on their belt. There were these little black boxes and they were called beepers because they would go beep when an emergency happened. And these were, uh, you know, anybody that just had an emergency or a dad. Okay. These are the people that wore these things right here. All right. Thankfully, technology has delivered us from the oppression of the beeper, okay? But um, right when we were starting Mercy 2015, I had a doctor friend who was still rocking it hard, okay? And whenever that thing, the reason he had it is because he also had his, like, scrubs on or something like that. He was on call. And that thing beeps, he's got to go. He's ready. He's already decked out and ready to go when he needs to go. And, y'all, that is to be us. 
We are to be ready to go wherever the Lord would call us to go, to take the gospel of peace to our neighbors, to our coworkers, to our friends, looking at every single moment through the eyes of God and what might he have for us here. Simple way I've tried to start doing that in my life and some of our guys in my community group started doing is just wake, part of our morning time with the Lord is praying through our meeting schedule for that day or whatever it is that's coming that day. I'm gonna pray through it. Lord, help me to be ready for what you want in that moment. Verse 16 of Ephesians 6, in every situation, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The shield of faith guards you against Satan's flaming arrows. What are Satan's flaming arrows? They're lies. What protects you? The gospel. Truth protects you from lies. Truth of the gospel and faith in it, that's your shield. Which is why we say all the time around here, rehearse the gospel over yourself every single day and abide in Christ every single day. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Meditate on the gospel always. And the sword is your offensive weapon. You think of Jesus in the wilderness. Every time Satan tempts him, what does he come back with? The word. It is written. I don't need your bread. It is written. I don't need to jump down here and prove myself because it is written. I don't need anything you have to offer because it is written. Open the Bible and let the word of God change you every single day. Pray at all times in the spirit with every prayer and request and stay alert with all perseverance and intercession for the saints. Wait on God and pray. Y'all, Pharaoh was a real enemy. He had real power. And he still, Satan is a real enemy and has real power. There was only one hope for Moses that God really will do what he said he would do. Same is true for us. We got one hope. It's the hope of Christ that we can stand firm in. Feet planted firmly in belief in the death and resurrection of Christ and the hope of glory. One day we'll be with him forever. Y'all, if you don't know that hope, I implore you, give yourself to that hope. He is worthy. He is the only sure thing in all the universe. The only sure thing, your only hope against the battle. And if the battle's a little worse right now, or maybe a lot worse right now, he has not forgotten you. He has not forgotten you. Let me pray for you. Father, I know this uh, week that I've had in prep for talking about the real enemy that we have. I know it's been harder on me, I imagine for many here on both of our campuses. I pray, Father, that, there would, that you would give us a sense of um, comfort. Would you spread that like you did to me? That that battle means we're in the right spot. Thank you for your provision in Christ. Hey, before, in fact, I want to just pause for a second. You keep your head bowed before the Lord. I just want to guide you a little bit in a response and prayer. Both of our campuses, listen, if you, maybe you've just been grumbling against the Lord. I want you to turn back to him now. Just turn back to him. Lord, I believe that you got out of the grave. He doesn't think your suffering is trite. He's with you right there in it. Lord, I believe you got out of the grave and you know I've been frustrated by this thing. But I wanna believe again that, Lord, you're working things for my good and your glory. I don't understand it and I'm still hurting. But I'm coming back and I say, Lord, I want you. I'm opening, I'm taking the hands off of my ears and hearing that you still love me. In Christ, you still love me. You see me, you want me, and everything I have, all I have is yours, Father. Thank you for the grace that you've given me. And if you're not a Christian, I want you to receive it today. Don't wait till Easter. Receive the hope of the gospel today. Because you don't have any of that hope apart from him. You can say, God, I know I am a sinner. I believe I need saving. I believe Jesus died for my sins and I believe he rose again. Thank you, God. I receive that as forgiveness for my sins. Thank you, God. 
Father, we, your people, respond to you. We love you. We give you everything we have in praise, even when it gets worse. Father, as we put on our armor, we pray, give us your eyes to see. See the lies of the enemy for what they are. Help us to even shield one another from those lies. Give us steadfastness as we go into battle, knowing that you will deliver from sin. You will deliver from the enemy and you deliver us to victory now and forevermore. And in that victory, in that victory, we praise you, Father. Prayed in Christ's holy name. Amen.
Union Church. Again, what a joy it is to praise the Lord together. And now we have shirts to say. I know. So I love to. worshiping with my church. <laughs> so a reminder, if you did your survey, got your email, go ahead and uh, send that back to us so we can get you your shirt. Yeah, absolutely. Before you guys get out of here today, we did want to let you know, since it's March 27th, that means that quarter two of our second year of the Bible reading plan begins this Thursday or, fr- or Friday, because that's when the first is. So you can go to mercycharlotte.com slash Bible, and you can actually find your year two, quarter two reading plan. This is quarter one, just holding it up so you can see. But if you want a physical copy, when you're in, in person on a Sunday, you can grab one. They'll be in the lobby. So we have those for you, but we really want to encourage you through the Bible reading plan, through these scripture journals. We just want to encourage you to be spending time with scripture outside of Sunday. Like yeah. we know that it's awesome to come and learn and and worship and hear from Pastor Spence what the Lord has been teaching him to teach us. But what about the other six days of the week? What is the Lord saying to us in our time with him when we're spending time in the word? So be encouraged to lean into that space. We do want to be a church that keeps the gospel at the center and encourages you to spend time in scripture on your own. Yeah, that's great. What a great, yes. <laughs> yeah. Read the Bible. The word is living and active. It will change your life. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one last thing, go to mercycharlotte.com slash Easter. Find out everything you need to know about Easter weekend. Pick up these inviter cards. Invite somebody, whether it's your hairdresser, your barista, your cashier at the grocery store you frequent, or take them with you when you go on a walk. Yeah. It's amazing if you pray like, Lord, give me an opportunity to invite someone to church he will put people in your path and it's wild like if you don't know how to approach someone even just going up to them and saying hey uh i know it's been like a really weird couple of years is there anything i could pray for you that is a great end to a spiritual conversation just letting people know that we have the love of christ in us and we want to share that with them and as a reminder one of our church values is we send god's people to to all all people people. yeah we (laughs) are god's people and The Lord has commanded us, has yeah. encouraged us, is our helper to go to others and spread his gospel. Yeah. So on that note, I mean, I think that's that's all we really have for you guys today. We hope that it has been a great Sunday. We hope that you've been encouraged and we pray that you would just be blessed and like kept in the Lord this week. So with that, Mercy Church, you, you are, are sent. sent.